This conference will now be recorded. Welcome uh, everyone to Shio Watch webinar. I'm very happy uh, to uh, present to you uh, Neil uh, Sims. Uh, Neil uh, is a research manager at Cesaro Australia with more than 25 years of experience in the use and, and the development of Earth observation um, and remote sensing to provide information on a wide range of environmental uh, features. And he is going to present to us an introduction to AquaWatch Australian program. Uh, Neil. Thanks so much, Gada. I hope you can all hear me. And um, thanks so much for the opportunity to present to you all today. Um, I'm going to uh, show you a, a, a program, a research program uh, that's happening out of CSIRO in Australia called AquaWatch Australia. There is, of course, Geo AquaWatch, um, and Mary Beth is, is uh, here, of course, with us. And thanks very much for this opportunity, Mary Beth. AquaWatch Australia and Mary Beth aren't the uh, AquaWatch Australia, and Mary Beth. AquaWatch Australia and Geo AquaWatch aren't the same thing. Um, uh, but we're closely aligned, and I'm going to show you a little bit about what AquaWatch Australia is trying to do, and then uh, we'll get the opportunity to have a think about how we can align our efforts and where we can bring things together. Um, but first, um, I wanted to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and the waters uh, on which we stand today, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Let me see if I can advance this. Uh, so AquaWatch Australia, it's a, a mission in CSIRO is the terminology for it. And it's actually uh, missions in CSIRO are these great big projects and programs that draw on expertise and people from right across CSIRO. CSIRO has got about sort of five and a half or 6,000 people in it, uh, depending on how you count them, spread right across Australia and other parts of the world and spanning all kinds of research fields. So when we can bring uh, that capability together right across that kind of spectrum, we can tackle these really multidisciplinary and complex problems in-house, which is kind of a rare thing to do. Um, uh, Alex Held is in fact the director of AquaWatch Australia. Uh, and uh, so I'm sort of, a, him and I sometimes do tag teams. I'm assistant uh, director or interim co-director, I think is the term at the moment uh, of AquaWatch Australia. But the presentation that I'm going to share with you today really draws on the work of many of our fantastic scientists in AquaWatch, uh, some of whom I know are on the uh, call here today. Uh, so I'm grateful to everyone. Thank you. Um, what, the way we describe AquaWatch Australia is that we're trying to build what we call a weather service for water quality. And so while some of the details aren't exactly the same, what we want people to think about there is a system where um, stakeholders and end users can, can check the safety of their water um, the same way you would do as you were checking the weather. And also it includes some forecasting capabilities as well. So a little bit of a forecast and ready available information about, about water quality. So that's the kind of, uh, concept that we have built here. We have um, goals that are national goals for Australia and we have goals that are international. So AquaWatch Australia has actually got um, you know, global ambitions here. And when you look at the statistics uh, globally, you, you find you know, statistics from the UN like that more than 3 billion people are at risk from unsafe water globally. And in fact, poor water quality kills more people each year than all forms of violence combined, including wars. So it's a big deal internationally, and there's a real need to improve the information about water safety, uh, water quality to many people. Of course, in developed countries uh, and in other places as well, there's increasing pressure on inland and coastal water resources from those development activities. 
Uh, there are costs to the environment. There are also costs for industry and users. In some cases, of course, you know, we might need very clean water. In other cases, we might need water that isn't so clean or, uh, and therefore not quite as expensive to, um, you know, to clean for some industrial applications, for example. So water quality isn't just a matter of making it as clean as possible. It's also a matter in some cases of making it appropriate for its use. Um, across Australia, we do actually have really good information about water quality, but it's collected differently in different parts of the country. And so there really isn't, excuse me, there really is uh, a need to sort of harmonise the water quality information across these different systems. And so, uh, you know, we are talking about developing here an integrated system of technologies and other things, I'll show you in a second, that'll support monitoring and water quality management. Uh, uh, support modelling and forecasting and support efforts towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we linked, we showed these three here, but of course, um, water quality is strongly influenced by a lot of things that happen on, on land as well. So even though these are really the uh, aquatic and partnership SDGs, the terrestrial SDGs, um, we think we can contribute to some of those as well. So CSIRO Australia has um, really a long history of using um, earth observation systems uh, for uh, interpreting water quality conditions. Um, and you know, um, this, there's a paper that this, these graphics are drawn on from 2013. Uh, we have a couple of people here, Arnold Decker in particular, I think is probably, you know, got a, a history of using um, earth observation technologies for water quality monitoring more than 20 years. Uh, you know, into the, into the past there. Um, and, and this graphic here is from Canberra where a lot of the leading scientists are based at our CSIRO site. You can probably even see the site, in fact, if you know where to look on this map there. Um, and so we've got this history of interpreting optical measurements essentially of water bodies in terms of their, uh, their concentration and characteristics of a range of water quality parameters such as chlorophyll or dissolved organic matter or total suspended matter, for example. So CSIRO is a great um, organisation to be leading something like this. And so what we did was we had, we've seen this need, we've got some skills in CSIRO. And so we did an end user needs and gaps analysis and in, interviewed many people with our partner, the SmartSat CRC, um, who are helping us establish AquaWatch Australia. And really there were a couple of, um, uh, themes that emerge there, of course, water quality is an obvious one, but the modelling and the forecasting uh, issues were really front and centre in our interrogations, um, in our interviews. And so what we decided to do essentially was to establish uh, you know, a, a ground to space water quality monitoring system that includes some forecasting. Uh, with the objectives of safeguarding freshwater and coastal resources in Australia and around the world. So uh, I'm going to show you now uh, what we're trying to do and focus a little bit more on some of the technologies that we're going to be incorporating into our system here. So this um, really highlights the three plus a little bit um, key technologies that we're linking together in AquaWatch Australia. In the top left hand corner here you can see this yellow diagram there's a a boy with a camera sitting on top of it that camera is called a hydrospectra so it's a hyperspectral camera essentially that sits above the water and takes a measurement of the color of the water about every 15 minutes you can adjust that and uh, sends that um, spectrum and those data to an FTP site, right? Now, the, there's a, many other um, water quality sensors that we can incorporate into this network. Um, the hydrospectra we think is fairly unique in its approach. Um, and so it sort of supplements a lot of the existing sensors. Um, the IoT sat is the sort of smallest part of the technology network. Really, um, 
It's about ensuring the connectivity uh, is uniform between the sensors and our data analytics system wherever we go in the world. At the moment, um, you know, we're relying on phone networks and things like that to connect up or to get the data from the hydrospectra into our system. And of course, that reliability and the um, coverage of that varies globally. Um, another element of the system is these things called aquasats in the top right hand corner here. And I'll show you a little bit later on, but really what we're doing is drawing on um, lots of available, uh, commercially available and freely available earth observation data um, and trying to get as much coverage of the um, of the inland and coastal areas as we possibly can, of course. The great thing about the hydrospectra is it measures the colour of the water in the same terms as a, as a, an Earth observation, a satellite sensor. Um, but none of the existing uh, satellite data streams really meet all of our needs. And I'll show you more about that a little bit later on. So we're having to design, specify um, these um, aquasats. And the hydrospectra data and the aquasat data get transferred via IoT or something else to what we're calling ADIAS, the AquaWatch Data Integration and Analytics System, which is a, um, a system of technologies based on uh, a platform that we've developed in CSIRO. It um, stores data on the cloud and it provides through Jupyter Notebooks and other things, the ability to interrogate and model these uh, data sets and it'll, it, where, it'll be where the, um, in the forecasting is implemented as well. So we're building this data integration system which optimises the performance and the storage and the compute uh, and also includes a lot of those modelling and analytics elements there. So I'm going to show you a little bit about each of those technology elements here. So the Hydrospectra camera this is our version 4 camera here. Um, uh, it's a, 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 the high, hyperspectral camera. A couple of interesting and unique features about it really is that it sits above the water so that it, uh, which means it doesn't uh, get so much sort of biofouling and things. Hopefully it's a little bit easier to keep clean, a little bit more reliable. It has a downward looking camera into the water column and an upward looking camera so that we can look at you know radiance differences things like that incoming radiation um, it's really good at looking at things that change the color of the water so things like turbidity things like algal blooms um, and it's also uh, as i said before capturing imagery and data in the same way that the earth observation sensors are over you know a couple of square meters of water or however big the area that it's looking at uh, and so it's really good for um, validating the satellite data, the observations over the water bodies. In, uh, in the top here, uh, we have a, a data system we draw into when the data gets transferred from the camera into the FTP site, we get it there via a thing called Synapse. And Synapse provides us a, um, uh, the opportunity to have a look at some of the data um, and interrogate some of those over time. So here's just some traces from the site in Western Australia, I think this is. And, um, and uh, along, along with the uh, hyperspectral uh, upward looking cameras, it takes um, uh, hemispherical photos of the water surface and upward looking as well. So every 15 minutes we get an incoming radiation spectrum, uh, an upwelling radiation spectrum and these uh, images of the, the region as well. Now this is CSIRO technology uh, that we're implementing here and we're working on a few things to miniaturise it and make it more robust and um, you know, include IoT connectivity in the system, for example. It's patented through CSIRO. Uh, I've got this little note down the bottom here and you know we're doing a research project, right? So the position that we're at in AquaWatch Australia at the moment is that we're helping, you know, we're partnering up really to help build this system to make it really usable for our end users. There is a camera issue on the last, uh, on this latest version of the Hydrospectra, a bad batch of cameras that came through the Raspberry Pi, I think. Um, and so what we're having to do is unfortunately replace some of the cameras in some of these units that have gone out. 
uh, to our partners around uh, Australia and around the world. I'll show you where those are a little bit later on. But you know, the, you get these things when you're trying to do something remarkable, right? So that's the in situ sensor elements there. The ADIAS, the data integration and analytics part, there is a system, an operational system called EASY uh, in, uh, throughout CSIRO and it's being used by about 200 partners, I think, uh, around Australia and the world. And it's really a facility for earth observation analytics um, uh, that lets people um, really play with the data. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, can be fairly open source, some parts of it, uh, but it also can be tailored uh, very significantly and really, you know, it uh, optimises the compute storage and analytics part of it. So ADIAS is uh, a specific implementation of this thing called EASY that's used for uh, AquaWatch. And as I said, what it does specifically is that it includes a number of bespoke algorithms that we uh, have generated that convert the optical data into water quality measurements. Um, here is a quick grab uh, from the, um, the little mapping interface, which lets us access the spatial data um, that comes through ADIAS. Um, and uh, it has, it's, you can see on the left here, um, it implements a number of algorithms that you can use terrestrial and aquatically optimised sort of ones. At the moment, these are just sort of published algorithms. Uh, it will also do things like uh, implement uh, atmospheric correction algorithms, uh, uh, things like this. And I've clicked, uh, selected here Landsat 8 um, data, but there's many others, all the Sentinels, there's Landsats, uh, you know, way back to five, I think. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's very tailorable and you can zoom in and have a look at specific areas and uh, interrogate those. And so I'll show you a couple of those. Uh, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're implementing, we're looking at specific sites at the moment uh, where we're putting our hydrospectra sensors in there. Let us focus up and test these hydrospectra sensors a little bit. We're calling them pilot sites and I'll show you where a few more of those are a bit later on collectively. This is Moreton Bay in Queensland and the water that comes in here comes out of Brisbane, one of the major cities in Northern Australia, in Queensland, and um, outflows here can impact the Great Barrier Reef, for example, right? So these are just some quick screen grabs. Uh, the scale is up on the top right-hand side here, just showing changes in turbidity over time. These were super easy to get operating in ADIAS. Uh, and uh, you know, anyone can do that. And when we get more sophisticated algorithms implemented, specific models, for example, you'll be able to retrieve those and back calculate those over time as well. Lake Tugranong is a lake in uh, a very urban area in Canberra. Canberra is this funny little city, I can say that because I grew up there, where um, they have the uh, little lakes uh, around town uh, that are essentially, you know, sort of, sewerage traps really. They're designed to provide a, um, a point of inflow for drainage water from you know within the catchment and a bit of a sort of biological process in there if you like to help clean it up. They also when they're in good condition they form a sort of a, a, a recreational centre for people in the towns. Lake Targronong is particularly prone to um, algal blooms and so uh, we've been having a look there again. I've just done the turbidity index on this one again, but um, we've got a monitoring system in there. Uh, Port Lincoln is in, um, it's actually in South Australia, not Western Australia. And um, it is um, the home of uh, the tuna aquaculture um, industry in this region uh, and again uh, we have a site uh, down uh, here the in fact the the boy uh, the that has the hydrospectra sensor on it, I think is just south of Port Lincoln um, so highly dynamic area here and also um, they're they're implementing um, desalination plants in this area as well and we think we might be able to provide some information that helps them minimise their costs in terms of making sure that the water that they're dragging into the system uh, is clean enough for them to use.
Now this is a slight step aside, but it is uh, showing some imagery that we were kind enough to be given um, by Planet. Uh, some of you may know those imagery providers. Um, if you've been keeping an eye on water quality issues in Australia, you'll see that uh, there, you'll, you'll know that there was this uh, uh, major fish kill uh, in the far northwest of New South Wales in a place called Menindee Lakes. These large, very shallow lakes that are sometimes used for agricultural purposes um, in the lakes there. And downstream of there, um, there was this major fish kill. And so there's a bit of a timeline here from uh, some of the, that we were able to see from uh, the imagery. There was a little bit of a question about exactly when the, f the dead fish had started to appear and exactly what the drives of that fish kill was. But here, it shows us, um, uh, this is comparing two dates actually, but the sort of the green water here, the dark green water is a higher algae concentration water. And on the 10th of March, we can see that starting to be released. And again, you can see the algal water uh, being released in here. And these little patches here, these bright patches here are actually the, the dead fish starting to appear upstream there. And then by the 18th of March on the right hand side here, you can see these white streaks through the main channel there. And that's all the dead fish that were there. It was a very significant fish kill. Um, turns out it was driven partly by having had a few years that were really great for fish populations. So good flows and good oxygen levels, things like this. And we think at this time that what happened here was that the algal water got released um, it, uh, it, it, uh, there was a bloom and then the algae sank and it just absolutely smashed the DO flow levels changed as well. And so we went, uh, we had these very rapid emergence of, of dead fish there. So that's some of the data imagery and analytics part. Um, there's a lot more to that, of course, and we're working on some of those things. One uh, I mentioned earlier that really there aren't any um, systems that are available to us at the moment that meet all of our needs. And so we've been through this process of examining what our needs are, right? Um, in part, AquaWatch, uh, well, AquaWatch Australia is hosted out of CSIRO's Space and Astronomy Business Unit. So it's in fact really a space program that we're implementing here. And um, so we're partnering up with a, a number of people to try and a number of organisations to help work through the specifications and define exactly what it is that we need and what is possible. And so what we want to do in AquaWatch Australia is you know, just a reminder of what we're trying to do here to provide information about um, water quality information to users in inland and coastal regions, in rivers, dams and lakes. And if you know anything about Australian uh, hydrology, it's highly variable. We in fact have the most highly variable river flow in the world. And uh, for a lot of the time, particularly when things like fish kills occur through those black water events, our river channels are extremely narrow. Uh, and so uh, if we want to have a look at those, you know, we need high resolution data. There's also many small dams. A lot of the water that's stored across the landscape in Australia is stored in these little tiny dams on farms and things like that. There's also a lot of different use cases, right? So we want to support industries like desalination and like aquaculture, but we also need to support you know, river water quality managers and other things like that. So by the time you pull all these things together, all of these needs together, what you find is, surprise, surprise, you know, you need high spatial resolution to see those narrow river, river channels and small water bodies. You need high spectral resolution so that we can separate out features from one another from the measurements over the water uh, columns. You need a frequent revisit uh, to predict especially, but also, um, you know, some of these processes are highly dynamic and you can see things go from, uh, you know, to, you know, um, safe for fish to unsafe for fish very quickly. So we want to be able to have a look at those uh, as frequently as possible. Uh, Hyperspectral information, of course, um, so that we can cover as many of the features of interest as possible. And something that 
in combination with those other features is really difficult to achieve is a very high signal to noise ratio. When you're looking into the water, you know, you lose most of your radiation going into the water, right? So uh, in order to get a good look into the water column or to see more deeply into it, we need that very high signal to noise ratio. Um, and here's a bit of a list of um, our needs, AquaWatch's needs, I guess, uh, and a, a comparison amongst all of these uh, available satellite image data sets uh, and seeing if uh, really if they meet or exceed our requirements. And so you can see this top row here is really what we're sort of aiming at. And then um, these, you know, the red box is essentially saying not suitable, yellow sort of is, yeah, maybe. Uh, and green is good, uh, and, and really none of these that we can access very easily meet all of our needs. So what we're having to do, in fact, is, is um, a, a couple of angles, working on this in a couple of angles. One angle is that out, out of CSIRO, our Earth Observation Sensor team in Adelaide, we're actually building, uh, you know, Australian hyperspectral compact sensors that test elements of um, the uh, detection and the sensor deployment and satellite operations that, to better meet our needs. And so uh, this uh, is a, a little uh, system called Cyanosat, which is uh, in the United States already having you know, just passed testing and is ready for launch. It's a prototype system ready for launch in uh, June or July this year. It's only really sort of guaranteed to be up there about 90 days, and really it's just to test many of the uh, many of the technology elements that we've incorporated in here, such as the sensor, but also including communications and other elements there too. Um, this sort of donut thing here. Uh, was, is a combination of uh, data images that were collected on a balloon flight, a high altitude balloon flight. That's um, been merged very nicely. If you you can find a video of this uh, on the web here, man, that thing was spinning around like crazy. So th the fact that they managed to stick to these images together at all is remarkable. And this um, this graph with the blue stripes here. I think the blue stripes are, um, are bands from perhaps Sentinel, I think something like that. Um, but uh, if across that range, uh, we are getting, uh, the, there is a particular way that the imagery, the spectra are collected in Cyanosat, which gives us a very high signal to noise ratio uh, in those wavelengths that we, where we need to get good separation so that we can tell features apart from one another in the water column. So that's what we're doing in-house at CSIRO. Um, and we're also talking with JPL, for example, right? So um, there's a partnership that we've arranged through a thing called the Western Water Applications Office. So my understanding is that that's um, supported by JPL and it's really designed the intention is to get uh, NASA technologies into water management in the Western United States. Um, and uh, we had a few really interesting meetings a couple of weeks ago in Brisbane with Rob Green and his colleagues. And um, really what we think might be a good way for us to go, they, there is a sensor that was um, fairly recently mounted on the space station called EMIT. It's about mineral dust mapping. It's a spectrometer. Uh, there and um, we think um, just in conversation with JPL that we may be able to um, uh, just change the specifications of the emit uh, spectrometer slightly to, to really nicely meet our needs. One of the things that we're going to have to do is increase the signal to noise ratio a little bit. And so we're in these conversations about, well, okay, well maybe during orbit we get the um, sensor to roll over uh, points of interest so that we get a longer look, for example, at some of our key target areas. And we'd have to work out how, uh, what compromises that makes in terms of the a number of sites we can image each orbit. So it wouldn't be a continuous capture if we did that, but we get a very good look at certain sites through there. Uh, and also, 
compressing the spectral range over which we view going out past much past about 850 or 900 or something nanometers isn't much use to you in most water conditions and so uh, making uh, that range uh, narrower will also be may have some implications for the bandwidth that we can sustain uh, with a high signal to noise ratio there too so lots of really interesting developments there so uh, so just to cover this off, some developments in-house on specific sensors that are suitable for aquatic applications and partnering up with, with agencies as well to think about how they might be able to support um, aquatch's needs. And I'll just say that uh, the JPL people have been fantastic and they seem, uh, we, I was a little bit surprised, they seem very enthusiastic about um, the science case that AquaWatch makes to support them to uh, adapt emit for a, a new application to them. So really fantastic partnerships and we, we're interested in doing that with other space agencies as well. There are really two key elements that differentiate AquaWatch Australia from the other water quality monitoring systems that we're aware of, and there are a few, so maybe we've missed some, but really one is that end-to-end -end connection from on the water sensors right through to space, and the second is the forecasting capability. Now, the forecasting element is something that um, has to necessarily start a little bit later than some of the other activities in AquaWatch because we want to get some of the data sets uh, to do that and need to get um, a little bit of a few runs on the ball before we can work out exactly what we can pull together for the forecasting. But that's happening now. Uh, and so uh, we are working on uh, implementing forecasting uh, capability into ADIAS. Um, we're keeping it uh, to sort of a small number of use cases. So, of course, there's many, many applications that you could um, you could use this kind of data for, uh, but really we're keeping it to things like algal blooms, the black water events, the low oxygen ones, uh, and flood plumes as well. Um, one of the interesting and sort of complicating challenges with trying to forecast water quality, of course, is that in order to know what the changes in water quality might be like uh, in the future, um, we need to have a look at the land sector in the catchments as well. So we need to have a look at land use and land management, surface conditions, organic loads, for example, uh, where um, the um, where the flooding is 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 likely to draw that material into the river or a dam or something like that, and so uh, it's really forecasting requires a lot of data, and it'll require an especially significant and complex approach when we look to forecast in areas where we don't have a hydrospectra, which is something that we want to do in future. So a lot to do here, but this is something that we're really trying to focus on as well. Really through all of this implementation of those technologies, you know, we are still impact focused. And so we do want to have real impacts in the safety and the quality of the water. We want to have real impacts in the management of inland and coastal water to improve ecosystems and, and you know, and reduce costs for industry. That forecasting element is something critical, as I've mentioned. We think a system like this has the opportunity to define a best practice in water quality monitoring and also sort of harmonise, so unify some of these differences in the way water quality is monitored across Australia and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, there's a note there, you know, just supporting blue carbon activity too. So there are a number of economic opportunities there. Blue carbon is one of them. Now, uh, I mentioned these sites that we're establishing and we've got about 10-ish functional, depending on how you count them. Uh, and we're, we're implementing these across Australia and the world essentially, right? So this network of pilot sites is really an opportunity, a great partnership with a great uh, partner, someone who we know has good experience in water quality monitoring with 
earth observation sensors or someone or and someone who can present to us uh, interesting and potentially unique use case the way we're approaching these partners is saying look come on board and help us build this thing so that it works for you at this stage we're not approaching these anyone really and you know informing them that we can answer your problems uh, but um, really want to help build something uh, you know, co-develop it with end users um, so that we can um, uh, you make this the best thing. We'll also add here that Mary Beth and I, um, uh, along with some other people in CSIRO, are doing also doing a lot to get Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous engagement in this program too. There's a bit more to say about that a bit later on, uh, maybe after this presentation. But so just quickly, uh, in Australia is where we're focusing, of course, it makes it sort of fairly easy for us to look after a site if we're putting a hydrospectra on there. And as I said, one of our ambitions is to harmonise um, water quality monitoring systems across Australia. And so we're partnering with um, the relevant agency state and local agencies across the region uh, and trying to bring these things together. Um, but we've also got partners internationally. So uh, we have a site that's now a bit more developed in Vietnam. Uh, they're looking probably at prawn aquaculture in the coastal regions there. We've got a long history of working with Vietnam, CSIRO does, uh, on water management issues. And of course, this sort of Southeast Asia region is something of very uh, you know, highly important to Australia. Um, as I might say, is the Pacific region, and we haven't yet established a site in the Pacific Islands yet, but we, we, we want to do that soon. The site in Malaysia is with um, a partner, Swinburne University, who are nominally uh, based in Melbourne, where I'm coming to you from, uh, but they have a, a, an outpost in Sarawak. There's a great guy there, um, Morich Mueller, who um, looks at, uh, is, it covers so many aspects of water, water monitoring, but um, there we're looking at carbon loss into the water, col uh, water column from land use in a mangrove uh, forest there, and also some work with plastics and a few other things. Um, the site in uh, Chile, we've got two sites uh, in Chile probably. Uh, salmon aquaculture is a massive industry there, and of course aquaculture, we have some familiarity with some of the impacts of that from Australia and elsewhere. But in Chile, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And so uh, we uh, have some sites identified there where we can partner up with uh, a couple of the key growers there. What's also happening in Chile uh, and increasingly in Australia as well, in fact, is the implementation of desalination plants. They're used for a number of activities. They're used uh, often for you know, uh, making potable water. They may also be used uh, for mining applications um, and also increasingly for sort of hydrogen energy production as well. So the desalination industry is something that we're keen to support. In Colombia, there's a large um, sort of a wetland uh, in the north, just inland from the coast in Colombia. Um, it's really, a again, another sort of mangrove carbon project there, but there's an additional element there of um, uh, freshwater intrusion into a saline kind of a, a water body or a brackish water body there that we want to have a look with. Um, the uh, Australian ambassadors in Colombia and Chile are super supportive and in fact CSIRO has a, a site in Santiago in Chile and so we're, we're implementing these sites through CSIRO Chile. The California site is probably the most uh, developed one. Uh, Unfortunately, we've had a little bit of trouble shipping our hydrospectra there. First, FedEx didn't like it and they just sent it back and it was their error. The second time around, we managed to get the camera there. And of course, I told you about that issue that we're having with the cameras in the version four of the hydrospectra. So unfortunately, that one's got to come back or we've got to fix it one way or another. So we're a little bit behind 
uh, in implementing things there. But the, the case study there is that uh, there is the San Joaquin Sacramento River Delta just inland from San Francisco. It supplies a lot of water for uh, drinking water and agricultural applications to a lot of California. Uh, there is a, an endangered fish species that lives in the Delta and it needs a certain level of turbidity to evade predators. When they pump water out of the delta, it clarifies the water. And so uh, there's in fact uh, pumping limits that are controlled by turbidity in the water there. It's this really fascinating little problem. And um, so we're looking at turbidity in, in that area. We're partnering up there with UC Davis, Susan Houston, who some of you may know, and Erin Hester at UC Merced, who is, um, uh, used to work at CSIRO in Australia and worked with Arnold Decker and a few other people like that. And she's fantastic. She knows so much about this. She should probably be doing this presentation, but really great partners all across the word, world. And we're looking for more. Uh, so um, not quite yet. By about 2026, we want to have about 15 sites operational. Uh, across Australia and the world. So we'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. So that's really the context of, you know, the technology, the justification, uh, where we're implementing things. Um, and so where are we, you ask, in terms of this process? Well, this sort of, the AquaWatch uh, idea was really born and uh, started taking shape in 2021. Uh, and the photo here is uh, a rare photo of me in a suit, which is you're unlikely to see that very often. Um, but in the 22nd of March, 2023, World Water Day, it happened to be, um, we launched the AquaWatch Australia mission. Alex Held uh, was at the UN Water meeting in New York. Uh, and if, for those of you who don't know who any of these people are in this image, this is uh, Lake Burley Griffin. You remember the very first slide I showed you uh, of a lake in Canberra showing some of those early test cases. Well, this is it in the flesh. Uh, Tanya Plibersek here is Minister for the Environment. Um, Ed Husick is Minister for Industry. This gentleman here is a local member, mem Mr. Minister Bean. This guy here behind my shoulder is Larry Marshall, who is the uh, CEO of CSIRO. And uh, this gentleman here is uh, the head of the SmartSat CRC and Andy Coronius. He's the chief of the SmartSat CRC. Very high profile, did lots of media interviews. There's a great lot of interest uh, in Aqua Watch Australia from right around Australia and the world. Uh, and we've made some great contacts through the press that we got through this launch. But back to the details a little bit. So uh, we had the launch. Now our next major objective is in 2026. And what we want to have there is the fully integrated technology system, in situ sensors, uh, ADIAS, and some uh, EO data, perhaps not anything bespoke that we've made ourselves, but Sentinel and Landsat with algorithms working on them, plus some forecasting across those sites uh, uh, at about sort of 15 sites. Um, while we've got a lot of resources in AquaWatch Australia from CSIRO, we still need to keep this manageable and we want to make it achievable as well. So uh, a network of op uh, an operational network of 15 sites at that time is probably going to be ambitious enough for us. We think then about 2028 we'll be able to get data in from an operational version of the cyanoset sensor that I showed you uh, and perhaps start thinking about getting some, uh, you know, if, if JPL and other people come good for us in the very near future, we might be able to uh, arrange some, uh, you know, get some data in from those as well. And then we want to grow the network out to 2030. So we're planning in AquaWatch basically out to 2030. Um, and, you know, want to have 100 research, validation, industry and commercial sites in operation globally by that time. We'll also say that the, the AquaWatch system is modular. So even though we might not have a hydrospectra sensor at every, you know, in every reach in every river across the world, 
the earth observation uh, the technologies will still let us predict within a, you know certain error bounds the quality of the water and the likelihood of water quality change in those regions across uh, much greater areas of course so uh, we will we will be um, you know implementing th these technologies across many more water bodies but have about a hundred operational sites with very close partners that we're working with there really the needs at the moment are you know partnership development and so it'd be great to talk with any of you who are thinking you might want to you know help us out or get on board with Aquawatch Australia in particular and one of the great opportunities through Geo AquaWatch is that um, we want to build AquaWatch Australia. CSIRO isn't likely to be a place that's going to support the operational delivery of AquaWatch data in perpetuity. Normally we'd find more of an operational organisation. In Australia we have something like the Bureau of Meteorology perhaps or Geoscience Australia perhaps. Uh, CSIRO is the science agency and so we have a slightly different role there. But um, this we want to build up some momentum and some interest in ensuring the continuity of AquaWatch uh, through by building a community of practice. So essentially the network of people like myself in CSIRO, our great scientists, partners at our pilot sites, coders, all of those kind of things that will just build up a community uh, around uh, AquaWatch and see it uh, ensure that it continues into the future. And I think Geo AquaWatch uh, is a nice complement to AquaWatch Australia that way. Um, and uh, of course, um, in situ uh, sensor development, miniaturisation, cost reduction, those kind of things are going to be ongoing for us. And over the longer term, of course, AquaWatch Australia is going to be, you know, could potentially be a platform to leverage lots of other activities. So, uh, for example, advanced ecosystem monitoring. We have some great expertise in Australia and elsewhere around the use of hydrophones for biodiversity assessment. Um, you know, camera systems again for biodiversity assessment. Really linking that kind of water quality measurement to uh, ecosystem structure and functioning assessments. That might be one way we want to go there, for example. Uh, and otherwise, you know, building this backbone of technologies is really an opportunity there to also, uh, you know, something that CSIRO can continue to, con to contribute science and technology to, as can many other partners. So we think that once we get this going, uh, you know, we're really excited about getting it up and running. We're really excited about building this thing. And we're really excited to see where it goes in future. So I think um, that's pretty much um, all I've got to show you about the technologies and the program there. Uh, again, uh, Alex held, um, you know, it would normally be here. Uh, Flora Kerblatt has been very helpful and it's a, and a really good connector for some of the international activities uh, in CSIRO, uh, in the Earth Observation Space and in AquaWatch in particular. And really I've borrowed a lot of slides from many of the great scientists who are working on AquaWatch Australia overall. So um, thanks so much everyone. I think that's all from me. Wonderful, thank you very much, um, Neil. And uh, I'm delighted to um, say that I think for certain that we will want to participate in your uh, um, offer um, for collaboration uh, on other items, not just the um, integration of the indigenous um, knowledge. Uh, piece that we've already begun working on. And I, I will also say that I think that um, we would love to incorporate your uh, um, um, user needs survey as well. Mm. We, we recently uh, published four other user needs surveys and I, I think that we omitted yours. Um, and so it would be good to um, incorporate those. So um, with that, um, you can, uh, if you're in the audience and you have a question for Neil, go ahead and raise your hand, unmute and ask your question.
uh, I, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, for the lake that was affected by the green water, was it was yeah. it a lake or, or a river? M Mendoza. Uh, it's it's a yeah, uh, it's Menindi Lakes, and and it, right. it is a series of lakes that flow into the Darling River Channel. So it's sort yeah. of a, a combination of both these these link. The lakes are kind of like lobes that come off a, a, a channel rather than sort of an inline lake thing. Right, and I that think that they, that they must be managed or something, as you mentioned. the The green the green algal water seemed to start to flow. I wondered, was there some management decision that preceded the release of that green water? Was there was it a like the water was getting too high and it had to be released, or did it overflow a natural dam that caused that? Yeah. Yeah, Seriously. it's a great question. There's this really complex sequence of events that happened just before the fish kill. There was a very large flood uh, that we had, and and of course that brought all of the material back into the the lakes when it receded, and the river channels as well. Uh, and um, I think temperatures were pretty high out there as well. Um, it was just great conditions for algae. Now. Um, the only thing I think we can say about management decisions is that um, we think that, you know, with a bit of a forecast of potential changes in water quality, it might just give water managers, a, you know, the best information they can to consider whether, you know, what to release and when to do it. The, usually the um, the options available to water managers, you know, they're not infinite, right? Um, and so if you've got algae in your lake, well, one way or another, you might have to release it into your river channel sort of thing, unless there's specific mechanisms in there. Um, but uh, yeah, it was very complex, very uh, many good, many years of really great conditions for fish growth. So good uh, dissolved oxygen and, and a few other things there. A great big flood, very significant uh, and rapid drop in flow rates associated with all kinds of temperature anomalies and things, and it just was almost like a perfect storm there. Right, the, that um, the perfect storms happen a lot uh, globally. Okay, I'm seeing yeah. a hand from Alex Castagna. Hello, uh, hello, Mary Beth. Thank you. Um, thank you, Neil, for the very interesting presentation and very comprehensive uh, in presenting this broad scale, the, the this big project of uh, AquaWatch Australia. Now, I understood that you present several aspects from in situ instrumentations to acquisition, processing, and making available um, orbital imagery, developing new sensors, forecasting and etc so there are several questions there are a few questions on each of those teams but i will ask only one and then later on if there's more time i can ask another um, one yeah. aspect is about the instrumentation that you have in situ because i understand that having the above water optical instrumentation allows you to maybe do um, local uh, retrieval even without uh, any orbital overpass or impossible to observe due to cloud cover whatever it is um, and of course, as well, to validate uh, somehow the atmospheric correction procedure. But um, I was wondering if there is interest in perspective, uh, especially if you're talking about global partners, so that it's an uh, international set, uh, it's completely different sets of environmental agencies and monitoring programs that might have other or additional instrumentation in the water that provides information for validation of what you're trying to retrieve. So I guess the question related to instrumentation is, uh, is it within the plans of GeoAquaWatch Australia the addition of uh, instrumentations in your optical package uh, that could provide a continuous validation of the quantities that are being retrieved? Yes, yeah, thanks so much, um, Alexander. The, um, the answer is absolutely yes. And in fact, we integrate uh, a number of different types of sensors onto the boys. You can hang them off the boys that we put the hydrospectra on. In fact, most of our boys have many other instruments on there as well, fluorometers and, and other things like that. So yes, uh, the, um, the integration of the hydrospectra 
data onto a suite of other sensors is very much the model that we're, we're, we're looking at. And you're exactly right. As I said, the, the system is kind of modular so that even if you can't see the water from space, you can still get uh, sort of this optical water quality measurement from the in situ sensor there as well. Um, uh, yeah, really uh, many opportunities there and we recognise that Hydrospectra sort of supplements a lot of these existing sensor systems. One of the other activities that we're doing with some of our partners as well is just bringing in their sensor data. So uh, we're really not even considering for some areas the earth observation elements just at this time. And the reason that we're doing that is because for some uh, stretches of river and some water bodies, they're they're, they're just going to be so hard to see, uh, you know, with the, getting that spatial resolution small enough with the rest of the parameters that we need is very challenging. So just a sensor network uh, alone lets us get information about uh, stretches of water that we are very unlikely to see for a long time uh, in it, it's a sufficient sort of detail from, from space. So yeah, thanks very much. Good question. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat uh, from Nguyen Van Man, uh, who is representing from the Vietnam Academy of Science and Technology, um, expressing happiness at the, at, the, at the fact that you have a collaboration partner in Vietnam and wonders what activity uh, that collaboration partner is uh, supporting the Aqua Watch mission for. I think you mentioned aquaculture, but if you could elaborate, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So uh, we're actually still, I think, finalizing the location of the site in Vietnam right now. But we were doing that um, with partners at uh, NAWAPI, so the National, I think it's Water and Planning Inf Institute, um, and uh, in, in partnership with the Hanoi University of Mining and Geology. So we've got those two um, organisations working together at the moment. Uh, we, I mean, uh, coastal aquaculture is such an enormous issue, uh, you know, and, and it's such an important industry in Vietnam that it's likely to be some that we go there somewhere. Uh, and of course, the the issues really are in finding a location are uh, things like uh, where we have. Uh, the, the, where our partners there have fairly easy access to the sensors so that they can maintain the data streams and the sensor itself. Um, uh, somewhere where they know the growers and they know the conditions there is fantastic. Um, and also the characteristics of the water itself that we um, that we need. Uh, we want to be able, we, we want to not see the bottom of the water body. So some of those aquaculture ponds are fairly shallow. We want to be able to, we want to, we want to look, see really just the water under most circumstances. And also we want it, uh, the area to be large enough so that we can uh, with luck see it uh, with, uh, you know, the readily available earth observation sensors. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, Finding the combination of those things is a little bit tricky sometimes, but yeah, no, we've we've had a great um, CSIRO Australia's had a great partnerships with Vietnam uh, on issues like this in the past in the Mekong Delta and elsewhere, um, and so we're really excited about getting the opportunity to do it again through Aquawatch Australia. Right, and um, in case anybody on the audience, as well as Dr. Uh, Van Man, uh, need would like to. Um, reach out to you uh, on behalf of, you know, maybe extending a collaboration offer. Um, they can just email you and reference. Absolutely. And okay. I'll put my um, email address in the chat here. Right. So, and just a reminder. Yeah, so... Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary Beth. Uh, just a reminder to everybody I have put some uh, two upcoming meetings in the chat. Um, as well, registration for one closes tomorrow. Uh, registration for the other one, which is a Geo Aqua Watch meeting, actually geared towards uh, forecasting for water quality, is happening in October. Um, it, I'm, I mean, it's happening in November, and the registration closes in October. Um, 
And uh, we're, we're also delighted to welcome Neil and his colleague Flora Kerblatt to our steering committee. Uh, we just tweeted about that yesterday. Uh, and uh, Alex, um, can you ask your, your final question very quickly and Neil can give a 60 second answer? I will try. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you again for you for the answer to the previous question. Um, so I would like an overview, but uh, if we maybe we can have this discussion, maybe uh, an additional time is the uh, about the forecasting aspect was not very clear for me. I would like I have some questions about exactly how is the state of maturity of the forecasting, um, if how much in time ahead are you going to forecasting? There are plans for continuous validation of the forecasting uh, data and things like that. I don't know what you can give in a in a very short answer, but I would appreciate something. Yeah, yeah, sure. So now that's a great question, Alexandra, and I'll admit um, immediately that. I'm not the best person to talk to about the details of the forecasting, but generally uh, what we're looking at is forecasting um, changes uh, over about sort of 72 hours ahead, I think is kind of the standard, uh, you know, plan, but really about a week ahead is where we want to go, right? So a bit like a weather a weather system there. Um, the maturity of the forecasting for Aquatch Australia and CSIRO, the, the, the gentleman who's running uh, the forecasting work package is Klaus Joink, um, and uh, I'll try and connect uh, you guys up to him uh, a, a bit later on. Um, but uh, Klaus uh, has done this kind of modelling for inland lakes in particular, uh, in partnership with uh, Tapas, who I can see on the call here. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think they know what to do. I think we're in the process of finding out what data sets are available, getting calibration data for these locations that we're trying to go to, uh, and, and that, that it, we, we want to have it implemented by 2026 over most of the pilot sites. But I'll connect Great. you up to Klaus and other people so that we can we can get some more, more details there, Alexander. Thank you so much, Neil. I think we've been dying to hear what's been happening on Australia uh, Australian Aqua Watch for for a couple of years, and you you gave us uh, just the tip of the iceberg, I'm sure. Um, but we're we're delighted on your progress, and uh, thank you so much for the for the update. Just a reminder to everybody, our next uh, talk will be June 22nd on the Gloria data set. Um, this talk today will be posted on our website uh, probably in about four hours um, from now. Uh, one more round of applause, um, virtual or otherwise, for Neil. And um, have a great day, everybody. Thanks for Thanks coming. so much, everyone. It's great to talk to you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.